All right. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for taking time to attend this roundtable discussion session. Uh, I will warn you all again, just as I did a moment ago, in case you didn't get switched over. If you're not prepared to have a discussion today, you might consider moving the over there, because it is going to be an interactive session that you have here. <laughs> not a lot of website visiting, not a lot of pictures on the screen. It's really about conversations. And um, I will say the title of the session you can see is Unlocking the Future of Education, AI-Powered Strategies for OER Adoption. And if you all attended Roy Wood's presentation earlier, which was using chat GPT to incorporate into the classroom, a lot of you, I think, are going to have things to contribute in this session that may really educate some of your colleagues that might not be as familiar with the tools that we're talking about here today. Um, yeah, come on in, everybody. <laughs> And again, I want to make sure to acknowledge that we do actually have a virtual audience present. So I want to wave hi to you all that are attending virtually over there and to let you know that you can interact with each other and follow along with the roundtable discussion using the chat, uh, if that works for you all that are attending virtually. And we have a moderator in the room, which is Crystal Smith, who's going to make sure that we capture and share the content that's going on in the chat. Um, once again, I'll remind you all, if you have QR codes on the table, too, that you can scan and join this session from your phone and even chat with a virtual attendee if you want to. It won't connect your audio because you're here, uh, but just know that you have that opportunity to do that. I'm going to start out today by telling you kind of what the sequence is going to be for this roundtable discussion, and I really tried to pare it down to action items. So we're gonna begin with just a couple of ground rules for participation in the discussion. Also a little bit of information about me, uh, more focused on my role and what I do to interact with AI and why I propose this session. I'll make that pretty clear in the next slide. We're gonna discover some things, including what OER is. I wanna make sure we have kind of a universal definition in case you may not have heard one today uh, that we can all agree upon here. Talk a little bit about how AI can be a companion for educators. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about streamlining because I know that's one thing you all have probably picked up on in a couple of these sessions that you've attended today is that the world we're talking about here has a lot of rewards as far as improving student learning outcomes, uh, increasing affordability and all those other things. But when faculty are the ones that have to carry this weight by and large, uh, it's hard. It's a lot of stuff on top of things that we're already asking them to do. We're gonna talk about creation and how you might use AI tools to enhance the outcomes in your course. So how could AI be a companion to you as you decide, you know, I wanna grow this component of my learning outcomes or a new technology has come that I need to start incorporating now? It can lift the weight off of you in some cases and really be a brainstorm part for you, which we'll talk about here a little bit later. And then in the final part, um, I put case studies and action items in case studies. I actually don't have any to present to you, but I'm hoping that you all might be able to share some use cases that you either developed, uh, you know, with your perspective out of this session, things that you might know of that you've seen in other places, maybe your colleagues have used AI, uh, you know, maybe using or adopting OER or elsewhere. And I'd really like to give some space for us to share those things out, or maybe again, talk about what's not happening yet, but could within this realm of OER adoption. So does that sound good to everybody? Hopefully not too fearsome. Okay. So to start out with, uh, who, what, when, where, and why. So my name again is Brad, and in case you all haven't had an opportunity to meet me yet. And I actually started out working at UCO in 2013 <laughs> as an academic advisor. Following that, I was an instructional designer, uh, learner experience manager, and a number of other, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, Crystal's back. It might just be a lag on there, too. Thanks, Crystal. Um, but again, those roles that I've had over time really, I think, give me a perspective of student advocacy and also an understanding of how technology can really empower students and also faculty in their role to be able to serve those individuals across our campuses, whether they be attending in person or online, uh, which again has become many or much of our bread and butter these days. I have an opportunity these days to actually work with, I want to pause. I think. Um, what are they saying, Kathy? I think they might see Teresa's There's a little bit, yeah. Just, just, just. 
And the first share screen icon is green. <clears throat> Still looks like crazies. <laughs> Change. No, can you can look at hers. Does she maybe yeah, an answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. That's it. Yeah, I can Thank you to our virtual participants for your patience. <laughs> we'll just go in the middle and I'll make some here. That's okay. I don't want to be Are you sure? Okay. Oh, no, it's not. Now we see our past for today. Oh, it's because I found it. Oh, you're just watching it. You're just watching it. You're just watching Good. I'm gonna experiment with something. I'm gonna pull this yeah. and she's like, I need to click this button. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I just break everything. I teach her to not say what <laughs> 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 Yep, yes. He did say that we're going to slide. He tried to really go around to you. Now we're on to you. Is that oh okay? Okay, I think that we should be set up again here. This has been like the day of tech troubles. I do not understand what's going on with computers around here. Uh, so to pick back up again, my role again in the state regions involves also overseeing or serving as the liaison. Just making sure we're all together up here. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you plenty of time to talk, I promise. Like That's what it's all about. Uh, but we actually have a new group at the state level that part the AI Impact Committee on Higher Education, which includes faculty members, students, administrators, residents, uh, and people coming together trying to figure out what to do with this behemoth that is AI. And I really have taken, I think, a little bit of a different lens uh, to AI. And honestly, I see it as my saving grace so many days. Uh, I have been incorporating ChatGPT in particular, as well as some other AI tools into my daily work tasks for probably about the past six months. Uh, we have pretty good support also coming into using this tool, even from our leadership, I think, because they see the scalability that it brings in some cases to the programs that we operate. And so, knowing that it has that ability to kind of remove some of that, or using Dr. Placida's word, administrivia. I think there's a real opportunity for us, and that's what I want to do with you all here today in this session, to explore how this can apply to faculty within this realm of adopting open educational resources. Um, so once again, knowing that I've been using this companion for probably six months now, maybe a little bit longer, I've applied this across so many different areas, and I know those of you that work closely with me on projects have probably started to see even a little bit of incorporation of that because you can't recognize when AI is used in many cases, but it's allowed us to do so much more. Uh, it's allowed us to, again, do just simple tasks of calculations. I'll give you one example. Recently, I set a committee meeting today. It's for our coal uh, subcommittees for the next year. So <laughs> seven groups that meet on a monthly recurrence, it's like the first Tuesday, that kind of thing every month. I asked ChatGPT to give me an outline of all of those dates for 2024, and it did it in about five seconds compared to something that would have taken me 
30 minutes maybe to go through and then verify all of those things, which again, that's administration. We're going to talk about pedagogy here in just a little bit. Rubrics are also another thing <laughs> that I can use this for. So we have a number of awards that are offered by our Council for Online Learning Excellence every year in a variety of categories, including OER, accessibility, teaching, uh, innovation, and leadership, among others. And so we had to create a new award recently. And so being able to have this tool and plug information in and have it spit out resources, including a rubric that may have five or six different levels, five or six different criteria within a matter of a couple of minutes and be able to use your time to fine tune that information and to make it what you need it to be versus spending all of your time within that creation realm of doing these routinized tasks it really can bring, again, an elevation component, I think, to the work that we do. Uh, this is also kind of what I hope that we're teaching our students to do within the course of college classes and other types of programs, including some of the micro-credentials that we'll have launching later this year. Um, but that's my why, honestly, for this session is because I think as we start teaching students how to use these technologies, we also need to understand what they can do for us as faculty members. What can it do to lift the weight off of us? What can I do to maybe be a companion tool for us that helps us brainstorm in a more effective way? Another example I'll give you is with some of the funds that we manage through the state regions, I use ChatGPT to ideate on program structures that we can set up to be able to offer grants to faculty for open educational resources, the special project grants for micro-credentials, if any of you might have seen that, uh, which closed just this last week. Um, it's just amazing the scalability, expansion, and companionship of thought, ultimately, that I have personally been able to find out of this tool. The other why for this session is that I actually did a doc an OER textbook in a class that I used to teach at the University of Central Oklahoma. We were using a McGraw-Hill textbook uh, called Business Statistics. It's used commonly in many business courses, the author's Jockia. And the cost of that textbook was $200 a pop for students going through there. And because of the scope of the learning outcomes in our course, we were using six out of 18 chapters in that book. <laughs> so OER was the perfect solution for us because I was able to go into my course, get those learning outcomes, find the resource that matched it instead of the other way around. But what I didn't have at that time is a companion to help me build out all of those other ancillary materials, resources, enhancements to that openly licensed text textbook that may have made it an even better version than the one that I came out with. Not that we can't still go back and make some of those modifications because it is OER. But again, I was spending hours coming through and trying to organize things, uh, even understanding the OER that I was looking at on the internet. <laughs> this tool can help you scan resources and make sense of them and summarize them. So again, that's the why here is because I see this as an opportunity to close the gap for faculty that are thinking about adopting OER and being creative and again, not having to carry all of that weight so at the end of the day. Oh, come on now. We just have all this big stuff. So before we get into the series of seven questions that I hope we're going to be able to get through during the time we have together today, I wanted to set some ground rules, and I do not mean this to be patronizing in any way, shape, or form, but I'll tell you, after having been in a number of conversations that have focused around AI over the last six months or so, things can sometimes go a little bit off track. Uh, I'll tell you, there are a lot of strong opinions about AI out there. If you all ever want to debate anything or, you know, have a conversation about it, I am absolutely down to do that and would love to do that with you, but I do want to encourage openness and curiosity in this session. So again, we know there are a lot of pitfalls about OER, so not OER, AI, uh, that exists out there. And I'm not asking you to set those aside entirely today. I'm just asking you to kind of think past those or kind of think you know, in the realm of what does it look like if maybe we do solve some of these bigger things that we're curious about. Uh, one of those being copyright, for example. Definitely don't want this to devolve into a copyright discussion today. Uh, that's a pretty easy one with AI. <laughs> Um, but again, we want to also embrace those challenges as opportunities. So again, how can we look at the things that we're hearing about, like copyright right now? Um, and again, you'll see some of the influences of how we work with students too, I think, and how this overlaps in a minute. Uh, but do encourage you to stay on topic. Let's keep talking about AI and pedagogy in particular, and then be open to change and adaptation, because that's what we're here to do, essentially. 
All right. <clears throat> As promised, I am going to go ahead and kind of set a universal definition for open educational resources. And Kathy, did I pick the right one? At least is this well, the best one? Oh, yeah. So there's no right one, but right. this is the one that I need. Mean. <laughs> And again, why I ask is because there are different definitions of open education, open educational resources, open pedagogy, all these terms that you might hear circulating out there. But generally, I think we can all agree upon what's put out by UNESCO. So as defined in 2019, open educational resources are learning, teaching, and research materials in any format and medium that reside in the public domain or are under copyright that have been released under an open license that permit no cost access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, and redistribution by others. So, the universally accepted definition of OER, even if we put our own flavors on it. One of the things, again, I want to emphasize about this definition of OER is that copyright doesn't go out the window with OER. Copyright is somebody, or OER is somebody if the material is copyrighted, making a decision to share that with an open license. They are agreeing that other people will be able to take that work, make adaptations of it, share it with their students elsewhere, sometimes even make money off of it, depending upon what attributions they apply to that. But again, I hear that misconception a lot that OER and copyright, they do swim in the same waters. It's just that the people have materials that they're agreeing to share. So first round table discussion. <laughs> What responsibilities and challenges do faculty face in adopting open educational resources? The way that these discussions are going to happen is that those of you that are at the round tables, and it looks like we have four or five or six at most, so maybe that should be good. I'll give you about four minutes to have this discussion at your table. And then we'll probably do two or three tables, I think, of share outs, um, you know, with responses for the series of questions that we have here. Virtual attendees, I would invite you all to interact in the chat and brainstorm there with each other. And as I mentioned earlier, Chris Love will actually account for your conversation there and share that with the rest of us. Um, but go ahead and again, I'll circulate the room. Round table discussion. So at your tables, four minutes. I'll meet my students. What I would tell you is time. Messy, but you have some You said no copyright. Suddenly, the I don't care. 
I <laughs> Yeah, All right, everybody, go ahead and wrap up your final comments on the discussion. All right, Crystal's going to start out by telling us about the discussion that's been uh, going on in the virtual chat. Um, so, hopefully, I don't know. But the kind of the main thing that I've seen there is um, concerns about copyright and licensing, um, making sure they understand it, feeling like maybe they don't understand it, not sure when they can use it. Um, the other comment is that they have to create the extra materials that the publisher would normally do. So it's not just writing out a lesson, it's also providing the extra pieces they don't want their students to miss out on. Um, and with that, they mentioned that those things can be built over time, but it's probably not going to be all done at once. We talked about a lot. So I think some of our challenges were um, accreditation. So some departments need certain materials for their accreditation. They can't just change the part of what they're using or um, accessibility issues. They're afraid to mess that up. Responsibility is just that they're responsible for updating the material and making sure that they're the ones to make changes. They have to go ahead and change it. So two great time cycles that I was hearing there. Again, creation of ancillary materials and updating materials. You can't just go with your OER for a semester and then let it coast. We <laughs> uh, publishers are out there updating books every year at minimum because they're making us get a new edition from our bookstores very frequently. Um, but those are two big concerns and copyright and in echoes there too. What's going to well, I don't like what you guys said. Um, Aaron and I work at a small rural college, and when you create a class, it goes through lots of processes. So we have all these classes created, and yeah, now if you're adding an OER, which we all want to do, we don't have time to recreate that class and align the assessment and add, type the um, discussions and the activities. We all want to do it, but we don't have a lot of time to recreate every one of those classes. Aaron, anything else? Description. Description. Yes. One more here. One more here. Our friends over here. Yes, I know you have a little experience in this realm. It's a big fun project together. Okay. Uh, yeah, I should be all 
We talked about the time and then as we talked about a group, I think the incomplete buy in. If you have uh, multiple teachers teaching the same class, like the OSU speech education teachers, they were all on board. But if you have one person that's not on board, they stop the process. Finding the right OER, we talked about that. We talked, I talked about how we had two different ones that we went and looked through, and that could be challenging just to find what you need. Um, people come and go. What happens when the original author no longer at the university? And then assessments, talk about assessments, and then alignment with course objectives. That can be difficult too. Okay. That can add to the time commitment. Sure can, especially if you're doing it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I get to next question over here. What AI tools are available and useful? I want to focus on useful. Again, uh, let's put it in context for faculty, instructional designers, or other colleagues that you might have. So again, specific tools that you know of within the AI realm. And this may be the space, again, where those of you that aren't as familiar with these tools may be listening to hear some of the responses from the other tables. Yeah. So that's okay. But what are the tools that are available and useful for faculty? to get a try in particular. But again, instructional designers and other colleagues as well. It is Uh, 
I <laughs> All right, everybody, this one's going on a little long. I'm going to start out by actually it's right here in the middle. What AI tools are available and useful for faculty instructional designers call on these digital print media in particular? We just asked AI to generate a list of AI. That's what we're doing. They may not be active. Writing assistance. Yeah. Yeah, so writing assistance, tutors, I also heard coming up over here, especially. Yeah, so I'll get to the browser that you can add to your browser. Yeah. I found out about GPT and slash GPT. One of this for others, Po AI. It's one that's like a meta AI. It has multiple AIs in there. You can test several of them out at like the same time and put them on your list. You can even create your own AI. POE, yes. So some of the others I've heard about, yeah. just because I want to get into the discussion. Uh, yeah. um, so Chat GBT, obvious one. Photoshop. Photoshop has, has AI integrations now too, which I think is very curious. Khan Academy has the Khan Vigo tool, so it's an integrated AI tool you can paint within Khan Academy. Khan Vigo, K H A N M I G O. What is it? Khan what? Khan Vigo. Amigo. Uh, we have Bard from Google, which I've heard mixed emotions and opinions on Bard, uh, especially compared to quality chat GPT. Uh, we have two focus that were one called GPT PPT and Slides GPT. So slide creation and editing tools. I think that's one that could be particularly compelling for the audience we're talking about. Google has Google Labs, which is a companion tool now included in the G Suite. Uh, Microsoft has the same thing with its Copilot tool that's in the 365 system. Zoom, as well as some of the other video conferencing platforms, have no taking capabilities there. Uh, Grammarly is also an AI tool which can be integrated across multiple platforms, including Google, Microsoft, elsewhere. And then the uh, last one I heard was PO AI. Harmonize. That's a great one, Margo. Uh, Harmonize is actually an online discussion platform that allows faculty to create discussions using ChatGPT within the tool. Yeah. So they can start out, you know, with typing a question and ChatGPT will help them within that system to make it a better discussion. Uh, again, a great companion to that. Really Any others, in, anybody in particular wants to give a shout out here or make sure that we didn't miss from the very short list that was discussed? There's a really great one I use called Goblin Tools. Uh, there's an app for 
that has like a dollar or it's free in your browser, goblin.tools, and it helps break down tasks. So if you, it also has like a meal thing, which is fun. You can put in like the ingredients that are in your break and it'll break <laughs> for, um, for you. Um, but tap, I, I used it for like revising papers, like if I'm stuck, like what are the basic, most basic steps of revising a paper? And then you can break down, and then you can break down tasks with it into subtasks, into subtasks, and more and more and more. So if you're, uh, it's really good for uh, like neurodivergent students or neurodivergent faculty, and uh, it's just, it's my favorite. That's an amazing example. Um, one thing before we get on to the next question that I want to make sure to emphasize is that a lot of the platforms that we mentioned here were really focused or existent as large language models. So large language models are what ChatGPT is, which basically has scanned the existence of the internet, which I know is the lowest possible pairs where you can get that. And then again, you can prompt things into it, ask things out of it, uh, shape the responses of it there. But AI exists in so many other content realms beyond just language creation and this kind of dialogue and interaction that exists there. And one of those I can give you an example of is with image generation. So you heard Photoshop mentioned there. Photoshop has an AI companion built in now. There are other platforms out there though, even including uh, Midjury. You may have heard that one mentioned before. Doll E, yeah. that's another one you may have heard mentioned before. And so I'll give you an example of the way that we use this actually at the region. So our supervisor, the, the division, Dr. Placido, he wanted better artwork <laughs> scattered throughout our offices. And so sent out a survey to every staff member that's on our academic affairs team and asked them to create a dream vision. So a written written statement ultimately, uh, and he plugged that into Dolly and Midjourney and created images for us to select and it's gonna have those printed and scattered throughout the office. So cool. I plug mine and that's actually, it's like Oklahoma's kind of digital uh, ecosystem of education, bringing micro-credentials online learning and OER together. It's an opportunity for career pathways. And it created this beautiful image that has a river running through it and a modern skyline and classic schoolhouse and digital credentials and learning. And think about it again, if you're using an open educational resource textbook what that could do for you potentially. Uh, and again, just even making your books aesthetically more pleasing, creating Im images again, that can in in indicate that meaning, um, you know, to really kind of produce what that vision is. Uh, Karen and I had an interesting exchange back here because she's not a fan of platforms like Midjourney as an artist because of some of the kind of controversies that come inherent with that. And again, I didn't want to delve too much for that, but I did want to mention that that is out there as something to consider. Uh, as of right now, and I think that there was a court that actually just issued a ruling on this a couple of days ago that ruled that AI-generated images cannot be copyrighted as of now. So is that is not, not fair to artists? Not what we're really here to discuss, but I want to put that out there that that is a concern. And that's something we should pay attention to. All right. Next discussion question here is actually you know, streamlining the routine and creative tasks again within this process of adopting open educational resources. This taxonomy that many of you probably can't read on the screen, but I promise I'll provide to you within the Zoom events platform uh, in the slides later, is a matrix that was developed by Oregon State University's eCampus. They realized, and as many of us did, um, the first two levels of loop tax taxonomy, which again are remember and understand, I think are where we're getting challenged the most with the onslaught of AI tools and challenged with our notions of the ways that our students are learning. And I don't put this up here, uh, and again, this may be useful for you all that are also teaching because it gives recommendations of the types of activities that exist within each of the Bloom's levels and what you should consider as far as alterations to those assignments. When I looked at this matrix, though, what I saw is the opportunities for faculty to be able to make use of some of these tools. And so if you look within the AI capabilities column here, I'll actually read these from bottom to top, just so you can kind of get a sense of the scale and potential opportunities or areas where this could be impacted. So within the remember category, Oregon State recommends that most of those activities within courses be amended due to the onslaught of ChatGPT. But AI can recall factual information, list possible answers, define a term, construct a basic chronology of information. So 
I again understand we're talking about the learning context, but think again, how does this apply to the teaching context, to instructional design, curricular strategies? Within understand, AI can describe a concept in different words, recognize a related example, or translate things. I can think of so many examples, Lisa, in that data analysis book where I could have made enhancements to what it is that we put out using this tool. Within application, they again encourage a review of the current activities that are underway, but you can make use of a process, a model, or a method to illustrate how to solve a quantitative inquiry. I use ChatGPT all the time for quantitative inquiry, so I promise you it's not always accurate. I actually had to do some simple additions from an Excel spreadsheet today, and it was about $7,000 short of my calculations. <laughs> Caution. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, then analyze, comparing and contrasting data, inferring trends and themes, computing, predicting. Within evaluation, identifying pros and cons of various courses of actions, developing rubrics. Rubrics, again, a very helpful tool here. And then within creation, this, again, I think is where there's a lot of promise for creativity. And again, it's not that you're letting the AI tool write the content for you but it can serve as a companion and enhance the way that you think about your learning outcomes. It can synthesize things that may have innately been in the back of your mind all along within your subject matter area, but you just had not explicitly put those dots together. I've had so many epiphanies using this tool within my own area of work with that regard. But again, suggesting that range of alternatives, enumerating potential drawbacks and advantages, describing successful real world cases. So once again, this is focused on learning, but I encourage you to kind of flip that model towards the other direction and think about how this can empower you or your faculty to adopt open educational resources. So how can AI assist with the curation, creation, organization, or presentation when adopting OER textbooks? We'll give you four minutes on this one, and then I think this might have to be our last question, unfortunately. Yeah, 
All right, everybody. I'll just start with our friends back in about Sardarmals. I don't want to share with us again. How is the guy that has been our team? Yeah. 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 About his logical, like how valuable is that to just have on hand? I know we have politics down the hallway that we can get that feedback on, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but it can help accelerate your career in the process of in a place like we should have where uh, you move it, you know, you have that open up that project for a course of time. I think so a lot of times we do check uh, labs yeah. when I'm writing out instructions for data science labs and biology labs, I'll throw my Introduction is to it and see, you know, have it basically, it does this flow logically through a process and that will tell you, yeah, it flows logically through your process or no, you know, this might not be clear. Right. Ask it to write or modify content for your audience. Yeah. Uh, you know, say, I'm for sending this content to these people, this is Absolutely. what they're it's surprising. I mean, you can keep a plug in there and say, write this for a third grade you know, and this for a fourth grade you know, and just make those calibrations along the way by Taylor for an eighth grade reading level, even at freshman college. So, and I'm not always great at that. So, I think. Again, I think about the content too. You might plug it in, you know, it's written at a collegiate level, and ask it to write it at the A C level. Do an, an experiment with that and ask yourself is this still addressing the same outcomes? Is it still accomplishing the same goals? Oftentimes, I put my own emails in there saying, you can clarify this. And it'll spit out something that I'm like, you can publish, I can write the goals. That's great. I think about all the tables so far. I want to actually stay with that only because we're running out of time here. I want to actually give a chance. Is there anything else anybody wants to shout out about what this can do for faculty in line also with this question here? How can these tools also help our faculty with grading and being practices? Rubrics. Rubrics, yes. It's the most succinct and exact and precise rubrics. You may have imagined it. It makes me disappointed in my skills sometimes. <laughs> but can I do as well as I need? Yeah. But again, any other advancements for them in this realm? Being able to get it to I don't want to use the name comment all the time. But how do you say you hit all the requirements? You did really well on this. 
eight times across you know, the course of the semester. So you can not get to reword things so that you're not just regurgitating the same comment all the time. Has anybody ever been sitting up at 11 o'clock at night and thinking, I need to create a test bank? Can I create repetitive questions? Why not ask Chad GPT to create problems? I want to go back to the correct responses. Yes. She wants to from the chat, if we're submitting our feedback, maybe it has AI about telling So the final question that I have here again. Which AI tools, because we talked about a couple of these examples and not too many of them here today, but just shout out if you're comfortable doing so. Which tools, if you had a faculty member that was willing or interested in front of you, what would you tell them to use or explore? How would you tell them to use the tool within OER or even elsewhere at this point? Which tools would be most valuable for them? Some human that knows more than I do that can answer my question. Okay. So, a human can to go with the AI. Absolutely. That's it. And, you know, think about support for us, and that's a learning curve yeah. challenge. If there was somebody that was a resource that I could use, I mean, I'm sure I could ask AI, how do I do this? And probably tell me, but it, it, it doesn't mind me to this resource. I think that's a great point. And, I mean, I'll tell you all, we recently uh, got Smartsheet, which is a project management tool in our agency. ChatGPT is my manual for Smartsheet. I asked ChatGPT, I'm trying to do this and give me step-by-step -step instructions how. And it's better than what I can get out of the manual for Smartsheet. <laughs> Yeah. I think Meetchat would be a good option for this because it will tell you the websites that it cited, and that would be a really good resource to include in the OER. Yeah, and yeah, to that point, also, ChatGPT continues to make updates to the platform. Those of you that use the tools won't be a surprise, but for those of you that don't use it, just <laughs> let you know what you're getting yourself into. If you sign up for a ChatGPT account, you will be introduced to the free version, which is called ChatGPT 3.5. It has a majority of the functions that I've actually list listed to you today and that have been discussing here, with the exception of the image creation and kind of the multimedia creation. ChatGPT 4 is the paid version. So you'll actually see both options if you log in. If you click on 4, it'll say, are you paid? And if not, do you want to sign up? I think it's about $20 a month. And it includes plugins and other functions that are higher up level and kind of enhanced compared to what you get in 3.5. And so you have the ability within chat GPT 4 to scan websites, to scan PDFs, to upload documents directly to the system, which can include PDFs, words, Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, and all of that stuff to perform more advanced data analysis on the content that you're actually working with. Uh, it can read web pages as well out there. Tracy? Yeah. No, I have a question. So if you load something from work, doesn't that make it public? That's a good point. You are feeding the algorithm whenever you upload your content to it. And so that's something that I think about pretty extensively in my use of it as an agency employee for the state of Oklahoma. I only generally want to put things in there that I know could be disclosed through a public records request or things that we're publishing online. And I would encourage you all again to think about that within the scope of your own research or creative works. Don't just be feeding something out there, you know, on Dory and thinking that nothing is going to happen or that it won't be used in another way. Uh, and I think, again, if we were to do kind of the second session, we could delve into some of those topics about your research, copyright, uh, what is actually happening as we feed this thing and it grows and it evolves over time. Um, but again, you can clearly tell we could probably have just a whole conference on AI, which maybe we will in the next year or two. Margo. That is a point to also tell your students, you know, don't <laughs> anything into it that you don't want to public. Yeah. Because students, especially your freshmen, don't think about those things. Yeah. 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 Too late now, we're not. All right. 
Any other final questions? Yes, back in the back there. Um, is there, do you guys have like an online resource about where to find these tools and what they do? So uh, it's, I don't want to say it's the wild west, that's kind of the wrong term to use, but it is so, uh, it's just proliferated our environment online, but it's hard to find a succinct list there. Um, I have not seen one personally that kind of outlines things in a good, concise way, but I'll search for them and try to find one for you. But there are so many tools that are new ones that's launching every day. The other complication, too, to mention is that, in this is that there are a lot of tools you all are using on your campus already that are beginning to incorporate AI functionalities. It's another thing to be on top of, unfortunately, in roles as faculty, instructional designers, IT administrators. Um, but yeah, I've not personally seen a good succinct list of that. So we can take a word on it. Marco. Maybe the LMS the tools group can do a help talk with and then maybe we can start a spreadsheet. Um, everybody can have to do it. This feedback, I think, and that kind of a list or collection is important too. I want to know if you think about the schools, how they're using them, you know, that you're good enough to leave those kinds of things. And you also want to work on that. I think they're much better. Any final questions or comments? Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to attend this round. I hope it was at least thought provoking for you.